Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar for Spec Innovations, NSA Syntology. My name is Elizabeth Steiner, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. First, I would like to go over some quick housekeeping. During the presentation, feel free to send us questions, and we will get them answered in the question and answer part of the webinar. You can also interact with us on LinkedIn through the NSA user group or through Twitter using the handle at NSA. The webinar is being recorded and we'll make, make sure it is available to you after the live presentation. So be sure to keep an eye out for it in your inbox. Now I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Steve Dam. Today he'll discuss each entity class and the ways to visualize this information to enhance understanding. Dr. Dam is the president and founder of Second Innovations, as well as one of our DODAF training instructors. He's been involved with research, experiments, operations analysis, software development, systems engineering, and training for more than 40 years. Dr. Dan participated in the development of C4ISR architecture framework and DOD architecture framework. He has also received an expert systems engineering professional certification from NCOSI. Currently, he is applying systems engineering techniques to various DOD, DOE, and commercial projects. Feel free to send Dr. Dan many questions through the LinkedIn user group or send him an email. And now I'll hand over the controls to Dr. Dan and we'll get started. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, so here's today's agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about what we mean by ontology. I have to think there's probably a few people who that's a, a 60, 60 cent word that they don't quite fully appreciate. And then, of course, uh, life cycle modeling needs for um, ontology. Why in the life cycle, what are the things we need to capture and understand? And then, of course, what the life cycle modeling language ontology is which is the basis for what we use in InnoSlate. Uh, and also give you some of the benefits of that ontology as well as a little demonstration, particularly how to get into the uh, schema extender in, in uh, InnoSlate and be able to manipulate the uh, lifecycle modeling language ontology in the tool. And hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions. So what do we mean by ontology? Uh, again, most of you know this, but this is a, uh, the basic definitions. So an ontology is a taxonomy, which I'll define again in a second, uh, and the re relationships among the terms and concepts. And of course that means the, con the taxonomy is a collection of standardized terms or concepts. And you know, for a database, this is really basically your schema. It's the bins of information you're going to store things in and how they relate to one another. So it's all the data elements and, and their relationships and how they work together to help form a picture of a description of your system or your architecture or whatever it is you're trying to model. So um, some ontologies are part of a framework. Uh, for example, there's the DODAF Metamodel 2.0, which is shortened to DM2, which is used in the DODAF world, the DD architecture framework world. Or it could be a language itself, like Lysopro modeling language. Uh, so how do we define a de an ontology? One of the classic techniques to express one an ontology is using something called ERA, ND Relationship Attributes. I guess I'm an old timer, so that's the one I'm used to and that's the one I'm most comfortable with. So, so that was the first model we worked with in this area. Uh, and ERA forms a meta-meta model for the ontology. It could be actually traced to language elements. The entity is sort of like your noun. It's, it's the thing that can exist by itself, person, place, or thing. Uh, a relationship is sort of is equivalent to like a verb. And so it shows you the connection between different nouns, particularly. And of course, then there can be adjectives and, and adverbs, which we model as attributes, both attribute on the entity itself, which makes it an adjective, and an attribute on the relationship, which is essentially the equivalent of an adverb. This gives a very robust language capability to capture all kinds of information and relate it to each other. Now, of course, what we're trying to do is something a little bit more than just pure language. We're trying to just try to make sure we capture the essential elements of information so we can describe the system or, or architecture or enterprise we're trying to, to work with and develop. So another, another approach today that's being used a lot is something called OWL. It's the uh, web ontology language. So I'm not sure how you get OWL out of web ontology language. It should be 
W-O-L, right? No, but everybody calls it owl. And it's, it's part of the semantic web. And again, semantic is, is trying to put meaning to the language. What do the words mean in, in their context? And, and so that's, that's a lot of what we're trying to do and understand because uh, you can use a word like tank. Well, tank can mean all kinds of things. It could be a fuel tank, it could be a water tank, it could be a tank with treads on it that shoots, uh, you know, uh, shells at people. So, you know, there's, there's all kinds of tanks. And so understanding that context is important in, in trying to understand what the language is. And there's different versions of OWL out there. Again, it's a, it's a well-defined uh, XML output, particularly, that lets people work with it and, and work with those semantics. And again, it's, it's, it's helped communicate that machine communications between different uh, ontologies. So what it does for us is it gives us a, a naming convention and hopefully gives us better communications between people and between people and computers. I'd say probably more the latter. <laughs> or computers and computers maybe maybe what we were really looking at. So, so what's the life cycle model need for ontology? Why do I care? Uh, so, so if I'm developing, I'm in the development process, I have a life cycle model I use. This is my favorite, of course, is the V. Uh, there's the Agile. Uh, there's, you know, just tons of different incremental, all kinds of different kinds of uh, spiral kind of models that have been used over the years. And, and, but they all have sort of the same basic steps. You're starting from a current state of operations and sustainment that, that uh, is where you have pain points and things you're trying to fix. And then you go through and, and start looking at the architecture. Well, how can I fix architecturally? And then that sort of identifies specific systems that need development or, or fixing or updating. And then that drives you down to a component level where you're actually doing your hardware software acquisition, buying and building what you need. And then ultimately you bring it back up through an integration test cycle and operational tests and transition in the field. In software world, we do this in a matter of weeks, oftentimes, in an agile framework. But we're doing essentially all these same steps. So it's just a matter of how much time you spend on each one of them. Uh, so, so thinking about that and thinking about that I want to support all the way through the future operations and maintenance and, and demolition disposal. So I got to think about all these things. How do I capture all the information I need in all these different areas? That's what I'm trying to do. It's very important because I've got to have documentation. Unfortunately, not all of the life cycles are two weeks. Uh, most life cycles are in terms of many years, if not decades. And so it's a matter of uh, being able to capture the information, document it, have it flow through this process and, and keep it in people's minds so that they can see how things evolve because obviously you're not you're starting in one state you're ending in another state and it's not the same so even when you're going into that new state you have to be aware of what's coming up so there's a lot of information capture and so what what kind of disciplines particularly are needed to support this well particularly and, and then this is not an all-inclusive list but this is the basic ones that we thought were really important which was requirements analysis and management, uh, functional analysis and allocation, a physical architecture modeling everywhere from simple block diagrams to actual computer-aided design. Have to be able that whole that whole breadth of functionality there. Um, verification validation, of course, and which includes simulation, and of course program management. All aspects of program management. We, Divide program management, configuration management, portfolio management, all the other man but fundamentally it's still program management. We're trying to do those same kinds of things. And if you notice, these are basically systems engineering and program management disciplines, and they overlap a lot too. We, we tend to break those up into two groups of people doing them, but fundamentally they're trying to do the same thing. They're both trying to optimize cost schedule performance. One does it for the system, the other does it for the program. So again, can we build an ontology that actually does all of that, that actually supports both the systems engineering domains and the program management domains completely? I think the answer is yes. And in fact, if, if people are willing to uh, deal with the 
language differences, the slight differences in the language, you can create the same set of bins. So that's actually how the lifecycle modeling language got put together. Uh, in fact, if you want to go see a little bit more about it, go to www.lifecyclemodeling.org. You can, you can see the download the specification, you can see the group that put it together. <clears throat> so LML uh, combines both logical constructs with an ontology. So there's some diagramming approach to it as well as the ontology together. If you look at other ones like the SysML, it's mainly focusing on the diagramming, the constructs, the logic constructs and things, and, and how to capture information visually. Uh, there is a limited ontology, obviously, it has to be able to capture that information, and there's a fair amount of work, I understand, going on in developing a more complete ontology or more explicit ontology in SysML. Uh, DODAF Metamodel 2 is, took the other direction. They, they wanted to just be uh, data-driven, data-centric is the term that's used a lot, uh, and so they want to focus on the data and they wanted to get away from the pictures because they thought that was adding confusion. Well, we're human beings, we communicate both with language and visually, and the two should be complementary to one another. So in LML, that's what we tried to do, is put together something that would be complementary and make it so that it'd be easy to use. Um, and clearly, we want wanted something that works across the full life cycle. Another goal I, I don't, didn't mention here was we want to make sure it was an open standard. It's, it, there, there's no cost to adopting LML. It is available for anybody. Again, just go to that website and download the specification, and you're off and running. You can apply it across the board anywhere. So the taxonomy for LML is 12 primary entity classes. Again, I'll use entity and element almost synonymously here. Uh, and so, so those are the primary ones, but there's some subclasses we found that we needed to, to express the, the, the domains we were really, really working in. And of course, it, it's meant to, to grow beyond that if you need it to. So it's, it's, this is not a be-all and end-all, and I'll, I'll say later again, this is meant to be an 80% solution. But the idea of the 12 primary element classes meant that uh, we have to have lots of types of each of these element classes. And so, for example, an action can ha be a function, it can be an activity, it can be a task. We didn't think those should be separate bins because they don't really fundamentally have different uh, attributes and relationships. They're fundamentally the same kind of thing. And the beauty of doing that is now I can use exactly the same approaches and things I do for systems engineering where I treat them as functions as opposed to when I'm doing my business process modeling where I treat them as activities or tasks. So again, I, I have that, that flexibility. Um, relationships, uh, almost all the classes are related to each other and themselves. And that's important. And it's also important that we have the ability to have consistent words. One of the, one of the things I've seen in other ontologies is they'll use a different verb form for going one direction versus the other. Again, uh, all relationships are bi-directional, again, intentionally. So an asset performs an action, and an action is performed by an asset. So those are consistent. Another consistency is all hierarchies are decomposed by and decomposes. Uh, I, I, I work with other ontologies where they got really nice, with much better words perhaps were used uh, that fit better for different ND classes, but got confusing as to what, what was, who was the parent, what was the child, what does that mean? And so it, it, using this simplifies that a lot. And then finally, a peer-to-peer, -peer where you're related to and relate. So in other words, the, the, the same class, an action can be related to another action. And that can be very important, or a requirements. You think about different requirements documents, oftentimes they actually have the same requirement or something similar and you want to have that relationship, but there are two different requirements de decks. So you're trying to, you want to keep them separate in a decomposition relationship, but now I also show how they're related to one another. So here's the, the classes and subclasses that we've identified primarily in the specification. Uh, the action is, again, your functional uh, behavior 
class, and that's where you're going to capture the tasks and things like that I just mentioned. Artifact is the place where we capture documentation kinds of things. It can be a document, it could be emails, it could be other things that represent an artifact uh, of, that you want to capture and, and make sure people know is there. Uh, assets, the physical side of it, and that's the, that's the idea of having the physicality. The subclass of resource is essential because it has some unique attributes associated with it that then let you have resource uh, loading on your, your, your uh, functional modeling. And so that becomes a very important factor. So it has some different relationships as well as the, as the parent class. Characteristic is a, is a general thing that can be used as a characteristic like an attribute of anything. You can think of a characteristic of uh, an asset might be the paint color. Uh, so they, you know, those are specific uh, colors and they, they have specific uh, ways to, to define what those are. Um, a subclass of that though, we knew we needed the way to capture metrics and you know, information like thresholds and objectives. Uh, for a metric, and so that's what the measures subclass is. We have two types of connections, ways to connect things. This is particularly connecting assets to assets, but it can be other things as well. Um, so you think about the conduit is probably the one you're most familiar with. That would be the pipe. So if I have uh, two places, two, two, two pieces of electronics, I'm connected with a wire, that would be the conduit between them. Or if I have uh, two places I'm going to move water to, that could be the water conduit. Uh, those work together with other things, and I'll point those out as I go. Uh, and then, of course, you have logical ones. This is how do you represent an ERA diagram, for example? Well, obviously, I need a logical connection of some sort between them. So that, that gives us that capability. Uh, cost, of course, cost, I hope, is clear. It, it's something that should be a, an independent variable. And so we make it explicit. And again, cost can be applied to all kinds of places. Uh, anything can have cost, right? An artifact can have cost associated with it. Uh, so, so those are the kinds of things. We, we, particularly in the tool, we've taken some of these things and, and used them specifically in the simulator to calculate information that you're most interested in. Uh, the next one is decision. Uh, decision is a, a place to capture your assumptions. And then, the, and then what decisions were made from those assumptions. And of course, those can be related to all kinds of things. It can cause a decision and require information that, that back up the decision. So this is, a, this is a way that you can finally get to what you're trying to develop, or you're supposed to be developing, which is called decision databases. Um, particularly as you go with longer and longer life cycles, capturing the previous decisions and the why behind those decisions is very important because Things change over time, and that decision may have been good then, but now it's no longer good. Or maybe it's still good, and somebody has a new idea, but it was the same old idea. If you haven't documented that and captured that, then you, you're going to reinvent wheels. You're going to go down old rabbit holes that you didn't want to go down. Uh, input output. Of course, that's your information of file, uh, data transfer information kinds of things. Uh, that works. Those are generated by actions. They're they're uh, consumed by actions. They're you know so input output. You can think of that that's a fairly normal thing to, to do. They actually can also be associated with conduits. So that can be your flow, uh, can flow information of what flows down the conduit, and it has a unit of size, an attribute of size associated with it. So you, you can start getting the idea now. These models are coming together. My physical and my functional models start tying together. Um, location. Uh, I'm a physicist, so I had to have space. And if you notice later, I have time. So I, I'm now very happy. I've got space and time, and then I've got my characteristics. I have all kinds of things for mass and other, other physical attributes. So I have ways to, to model physical things and physics as well as uh, the actual system. Uh, risk. Risk is an important one, of course, for program management work. Uh, it's a very fundamental thing. It's often misunderstood. It's often thought of as a management problem. You know, risk is a technical problem, at least risk identification is. Now it's the management's job to do risk mitigation and help with the whole management of risk. Um, 
statements are a general thing. You're looking for the general contextual information. And of course, a subclass of that is uh, requirement. And that has very specific attributes for quality to say what makes a good requirement. And then finally is time. We want to make sure we had something to capture time in so you can do schedules and other things like that with it eventually with milestones, so you can create milestone charts and things like that. So, so if you look at this set of information, it's a lot of bins. Uh, it's a lot of, lot of information. It's all interrelated. You'll see the relationships in a second. And, and so it's, but we've tried to keep it the simple set so that we don't have to have that, that all, when you see all the relationships tied with this, you can imagine the complexity you're trying to deal with. Um, so so we're, we think this gives you your basis for capturing information throughout the life cycle. You may decide, gee, I need something more and, and want to extend it. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But look hard at what's there because it's, it's, fairly, it's very complete. Uh, here's some of the way to look at the models. So you can take some of those ND classes we're looking at and, and then group them together. And so you have the documentation entities, which I still think are very, very important. Uh, it's a way we communicate is through documents. There's no reason we can't do that still. But what we recommend is doing it in the tool. So now you have something that's more addressable, more relatable to other things in the models. And we'll show you, we can show you that maybe at another time. Um, the functional model is primarily using actions and inputs and outputs. You'll see that classic functional models like IDEFs and things like that, IDEFs zeros, uh, have that kind of, kind of look to them. The physical model, again, is your, is your asset resource and connection, actually conduit principally there. But also with, uh, we use that for the uh, ERA diagram, we'd use the logical connector as well. So uh, then the last set is the parametric or program entities. These are things that we know we need to capture to make sure we are tracking things. So the metrics obviously fit into that, the measures class and characteristics, location, cost, risk, decisions, and time. So that all together get, shows you how basically these models interact with each other too. So some of the specific relationships, this is kind of the primary chain. So it goes from artifact to statement to, which of course requirements can be a sub part of that, to actions, to assets, to characteristics, that linkage. And then you see the input, output, and connector kind of conduit information. So again, this is a good way to kind of see the basic relationships as you're getting into it. The reason it's good to keep these kinds of simplified models in mind is when you look at the bigger picture, literally everything's connected to everything. And so uh, this is quite an eye chart. I don't expect you to read it. That's why we blow up a section of it. But uh, it, it, it's actually nice in the documentation. It's on 11 by 17. You can use your 11 by 17 printer finally, again. Uh, <laughs> it, it is that big. Uh, <clears throat> so for, for example, the, what we pulled out of it is an asset to another asset can be decomposed by course, orbits or orbited by, and that's an interesting one because the location entity, one of the location elements I didn't mention was orbital. And so it turns out that has a very different kind of relationship. It's, you know, the sun's not decomposed by the earth. All right. So, so that, you know, what's that relationship between the sun and the earth? Well, orbits, it fits that much better. And of course, related to relates. So those, those are pretty common. Those are common. Well, that gives you an idea. You can read the table. There's a lot of information here. So a lot of people say, well, you're, you can't be, you can't just have those 12 bins. It's, it's too simplistic. Well, no, the, the real complexity is hiding in more in the relationships. And by the way, these relationships may even have attributes associated with them. So it's very complex. It is capturing a lot of complex information. But we think that the, the number of bins being smaller helps you get into the ontology a little bit easier. Uh, so diagrams. Diagrams really are needed for every class, but there are only, there's only three specified specifically by the lifecycle modeling language. The others, let me hit the others first, are standard things you're used to using. 
uh, for example, a time diagram. Well, there's nothing wrong with using a Gantt chart. It's a perfectly good way to communicate. We think it's a great way to do it, or a timeline diagram. You know, it's the type of thing you draw in a PowerPoint diagram or something is perfectly fine. Uh, data modeling. Class diagrams become ubiquitous. Everybody understands it. Everybody uses it. It's one of the introductory things in a basic uh, software class. You, the first time you take a software class, they make the, introduce you to, to a class diagram. Of course, the block definition diagram is the equivalent in SysML, systems modeling language. So you, you see, those kinds of things are the ones that, that just why reinvent those wheel? Why? But recognize that you need them. And they need to be available to you to visualize the information. So let's talk about though the, the next three, because those are the ones that are specific. So the really probably only unique diagram, although how unique it is is arguable, uh, is the action diagram. What makes this unique is the fact that we don't use any constructs. Typically, you'll see a, a symbol uh, like an and or an or. In, in one of these other kinds of languages. Instead, what we realize with those are generalizable uh, decision points. And decision points are something you want to capture because, after all, that's an important part of your command and control system, your information assurance. Uh, this is how you can get, if, you do, if you're an AI, IA person, you understand about defense in depth. This is how you get to defense in depth. This is how you embed your command and control into things deeper. And so, so those can be allocated to the actions, a assets that actually perform them uh, in, in very easily, but still it's deep in the modeling and those, those decision points then are available. So that was kind of a big adjustment. Uh, this is not too dissimilar to what you do in electrical engineering diagram, by the way. So it has some, some heritage there, but this was a way to do that and simplify that whole set. And a lot of people say, well, do you have enough logical constructs? We think we do. We think we've managed to deal with all the different problems. So if you think we need another one, uh, please tell us what you think that is. We'll talk about it. Uh, asset diagram. So here's another one, of course, we think is important. You, you've got to have a physical diagram of some sort. Now, if you look at the top one, it's just two assets and a conduit together. That's the kind of general block diagram form you see. But gosh, most of us like to see the pretty pictures and the lightning bolts and all that kind of stuff. So, so we recommend also thinking about that and implementing that capability. Because it's really the same thing. It's just another way to visualize the asset as a picture and a conduit as maybe ones and zeros or as a lightning bolt. So just a way to do that. Uh, in in InnoSlate, we've actually enabled that plus putting a background in it. So you can create your whole high-level concept diagram, what Dodaf calls OV1, uh, in the tool itself as well. And of course, a spider diagram. The spider diagram, again, is not a new diagram in a sense. It's been around for a long time. People understand what it is. This shows the different entities and their relationships. And the way it's been implemented in InnoSlate, you can click on the, any one of the boxes and you also get a sidebar with all the attributes associated with it. So this becomes a very, very powerful diagram for the ontology. You can manipulate your entire ontology, ontological instances all the way through this using this diagram. It's, it's, uh, it's powerful and dangerous. <laughs> it's anything that's powerful. So, so we didn't we didn't think that that was the be all and on end all because one of the recognitions is, particularly for systems engineers, but also for program managers, your job is a translator. You're spending a lot of your time talking to different domain experts and getting them try to work together. Uh, that's the job, <laughs> both groups. And so what we wanted to do is be able to make sure we can map to other languages. So here's some instances of where we're showing that. I'll show a little more in depth here in a minute to uh, talk about SysML, particularly, and, uh, and uh, uh, DM2. But basically, it's, it's a simple mapping, in most cases, from one language to another. So it's just a matter of doing that. Even the symbologies, the fact that we have a, um, a different kind of symbol, in the special case of the action, you could substitute it in a picture with that another symbol. Now, of course, 
you wouldn't ha if you just had the drawing and they didn't do that, you wouldn't have that functionality. Uh, when we actually implemented this in Innoslate, we gave you both. So if you do an activity diagram, for example, in SysML, you actually, even though we show the constructs, that construct is actually a, a special case of the action and decision point that you could still allocate. So, so you have all that functionality and you can use the language you're more comfortable with working in. Uh, so SysML, I mentioned systems modeling language. It's nine diagrams used to capture all kinds of information. Uh, it's an extension of the unified modeling language, which was the one developed for software. SysML was thought to be helpful because a lot of the problems people are running into in this area is with software. Uh, so th they thought this would be a good way to help facilitate that communication. Uh, so, so again, it uses XMI for the kind of import-export capabilities, and it has some symbology and terminology that actually is pretty unfamiliar with many systems engineers, let alone other stakeholders. Uh, we kept running into all kinds of problems when we used UML and SysML on projects uh, that people were complaining. Uh, particularly the stakeholders, was they didn't understand what the meaning was, and they, they'd get lost in all the symbology. And so what we wanted to do is have something simpler for them to see and work with. Uh, to implement SysML in uh, LML, uh, the group got together and created LML 1.1, and there was a very simple, some decisions. Uh, the new class was equation. Uh, that's to support the parametric diagram, give it a container for the parametric diagram. Um, we hadn't really thought about that before, but that seems like a good add. Uh, and then we extended the asset class to a port, and that's a special connection kind of connector kinds of things that goes in there. So that was another thing that was thought of, but, but that's the reason it's a extension of asset is then now it can be a um, uh, a child of a, a particular asset, which makes sense, because if you think about your your computer, you have a, a, U, a USB port. Well, okay, that's actually a little port piece of hardware inside the computer. So, so again, that'd be a logical place for that. Uh, of course, we add some new relationships uh, for the classes across the board. The equation of equation four has variable of things like that. Those are things again pretty much for the parametric diagram was why those were added. And then all kinds of other relationships were needed uh, to, for the requirements diagram. You can see satisfied by, satisfied, by, those kinds of things all the way through. So, so again, there were things that were added as needed to give the full plethora of diagrams. So the end result, at least in, uh, in particular the way we've now implemented it in Innoslate, is you get all the diagrams you're looking for uh, and can work with them. The nice thing is all of them talk to each other. So now if I have an action in one diagram, it will automatically show up in another diagram. I can, I can draw the activity diagram and I can instantly get an action diagram out of it. So it, the, the, the same actions that are used in the sequence diagram or show up on the other diagram. So again, this, this just helps with the whole uh, being able to work together uh, and view the information in many different ways. Same thing on the physical modeling side. In fact, some of the physical models I've, I've particularly gotten uh, enthused with the, the internal block diagram and even the block definition diagram have some, some real good value. So it's exciting. And of course, we hadn't had anything like a parametric diagram. So although I still prefer my equations uh, as an equation, um, unfortunately right now we don't have a good way to add an equation editor to this kind of thing. So this is our best way of doing that. And last but not least is the requirements diagram itself for requirements and again fully implemented. Um, and so that's SysML in a nutshell. Uh, uh, DODAF was in a sense easier, in a sense harder. Uh, there were a lot of different mappings that had to be created. Um, and so that was done mostly though we were able to add a, a, a type uh, which has been implemented in uh, an in slate as a label. And so you can have a, a capability as an action with the type, with a capability label on it, capability type on it. Um, 
again, this is then used for translation. So in, in InnoSlate, we have a DoDAF dashboard. And so what we do is we show the actual translation in the, into the DM2 um, entity so you can see how many activities you have versus actions, things like that. Uh, another thing we do is output it as the physical exchange specification. That is what is required to be conforming according to the DoDAF website. So that's why we did that. And so I'm um, not sure how many people can ingest a PES file uh, from other tools. I know we cannot at the moment. So again, we're looking to hopefully be able to do that in the future. Finally, uh, recently a, a customer asked us to uh, see if we couldn't give LML an OWL. So uh, downloaded Protege, which is a nice freeware tool by Stanford University. I want to always give credit where credit's due. And uh, so it's actually pretty easy to learn and use. I, I think I did a halfway decent job of getting this these in. So, so we actually do have it in that format. If somebody's interested in, in getting that, we can provide it. So what's the benefits of the LML ontology? Well, really, we think it's broad. It covers the entire life cycle, both technically and programmatically. So you have all aspects of what you're looking for. Uh, so this, this supports the entire product life cycle. So if you think about the whole product lifecycle management that, that's PLM, this is really supporting all of that. Uh, it's ontology-based principally. It makes the translation from LML of other languages back fairly easy. Uh, so we were able to do those mappings fairly straightforwardly. Um, again, it has all the capabilities of SysML basically once we added in the LML 1.1 extensions and DODAF. So we provided all the DODAF views as well. Um, and so, very simple structure to start with, at least get you into it. Again, there's complexity to it, I don't want to kid you, but it's, uh, it's, it really will get you where you need to go, I think. And of course, useful for stakeholders across the life cycle. So what LML does for us, it gives us that fundamental foundation for a tool to support systems engineering, particularly, and program management. And it contains the basic technical program management classes needed I mentioned before, it defines the action diagram to better enable that definition of logic as functional requirements. And I think that's an important part of what this has added to the, uh, the discipline. Um, and of course, using the physical diagrams for abstractions and instances and clones. So that's a, one of the ways we got around the needing uh, as many logical constructs. We have the idea of cloning. So now you can have more than one instance of something. And of course, we, we absolutely agree that, that it's meant to be the 80% solution. That's, although I've been finding it to be more than 95% solution. Most of the time today, when I add stuff, I rarely have to add new classes and relationships. Mostly I'm adding labels, which are adding types. So it's a way to categorize or, uh, the information a little bit more. So a little demonstration, and what I'm going to do is show you mostly uh, the, uh, the, the tools um, uh, um, schema extender. So, so here's the dashboard, and you can go to database view, and you can see the different NB classes. If I click on action here um, and go to table view, I can see all the different attributes associated with it. So you can see the number, the name, description, duration, start, that kind of thing. Uh, another way to look at that same piece of information is look at open the entity view for it. So here's where you see the, uh, again, attributes are showing here. And again, if you're not sure what things mean, like expected result, here's a definition of the word ex expected result. By the way, uh, this is actually, I happen to click a test case. It's a, it's a subclass of action, and that was developed for our new uh, test center capability in the tool. So we did extend the scheme ourselves to deal with that. Now, I, I don't know if I have a slide for that or not, but I can certainly talk about that later if anybody's interested. Um, and of course, it shows decomposition. It shows all these other relationships. So here's your decomposed by elements. Uh, 
Uh, we separated it out since there's so many relationships you can have tabs to kind of group things. So here's what the program manager mostly would be concerned about. Here would be the resources if you're doing resource modeling. And if if you're if you want to see them all, they're all here. <laughs> so so you can see the all the different relationships and how they're tied together. So that's that's a quick way to look at it at the instance level. If you want to make changes to this, two places. One, you can add a new label right here. So you, if I wanted to add a label for this, uh, I could add add that. Uh, I right now don't don't have one I particularly wanted to add, but uh, but I could do that right here. It's very easy. It clicks in new label. I type in the new label name. Uh, new label. I'm not going to save this. Uh, we highly recommend the description, the why I did this. <laughs> so more specific definition. Invariably, the label is like one word or two words at most kind of thing. So you want to give it more. You can hide things if you want. Uh, that's, that's, that's again, so obviously if I'm adding one, I'm not going to hide it. Uh, linked label is another special thing. I don't want to get into that right now. And any, you can associate with a particular class. So none would actually associate with all. So anybody could use the my label. But if you want to be uh, only accessible for actions, I'd select action. And it can have a parent label. So you can actually create a hierarchy of labels as well. So that's a, that's a very quick way to add labels. I am going to, uh, I'm going to get out of that very quickly. <laughs> Save and close, by the way, is the default. So I don't want to do that. I will go back. Uh, so so um, it would have added it to this list, and then I have to add it to here. So if I want to do more general schema extension, that's here in the menu. Go up to the menu, come over here to Tools, and Schema Editor. So let's bring that up. And so you start with the classes. So here are the different classes that are available to you. Um, again, here's a place where you can hide classes. Let's say you're this is too much for people you're working with right now. They don't want to get into all the SysML or all the programmatic stuff or whatever we exposed at the moment, you can hide it. And that way they don't have to see it right away and it can reduce the confusion. Um, a lot of people see that first one. Uh, it can be, if you add new ones, they can be abstract. So you don't, you don't have to actually implement them, but you can use it to help group and provide common attributes and relationships to the subclasses as well. And of course it would tell you what the parent is class. Uh, here's where you add properties. If I want to add another attribute, I just click Add and add the property name, description for it, uh, tech, you know, what kind of thing is it, a Boolean perhaps, is it hidden or not? Of course, you, you, you would not want to type yes there, right? You won't know. Okay, so, so things like that. You could add that or you could add a new relationship. And again, here's where you would have probably have added a relationship already using the relationship editor first, so before you get into here. So very simple, pretty quick. And by the way, the default on the this is is actually not save and close. <laughs> it, it, it actually does not save, so be, be careful with that. Uh, going back, labels, here's that same thing with labels. And again, I, if I've got too many labels, I'm just going to hide them like I can get rid of ones I'm not interested in seeing or don't want to use. Um, and relationships. So here's another one. Here's where your relationships are set up. You can set up a new relationship if you want. It will force you to create the inverse relationship at the same time because all relationships in um, uh, any, oh, and here's where you add a property to the relationship. So I'm going to show you that. So, so apps, these, these are things that, uh, that are available for you to work with. Again, very easy to use this uh, scheme editor. If you want to create a template for everybody else to use, we recommend start with a clean database. And you're going to, if you're going to do this separately, start with a clean database and then export that and then share, share the import export capabilities with it that way. Um, so I think I'm at a good point to uh, 
stop and a answer questions uh, rather than going into any more depth because uh, I want to give you time to ask things you're interested in. So Elizabeth, do you want to, uh, do we have any questions yet? Absolutely. We've received several questions already. If you haven't done so, please send your questions to the panel on the right, and we'll get to as many questions as we can before our time is up. So for our first question, I'm going to go ahead. Um, you have used the ERA view, noun, verb, adjective, adverb, view of things. Is it possible to compare SysML versus LML in the parlance? I find SysML weak at relationships clearly describing, and not even sure how I'd adverb them other than I think of methods in the class object. Body, is LML really stronger at this? So really two questions. So the first question is, is it possible to compare SysML versus LML in that parlance? So, so that's what we did. We actually had to map what would make and create the SysML diagrams, what ontologically, because we derive all the diagrams from the data in the database. So if you make a change in one diagram, it's automatically rippled through all the other diagrams. So we had to make that translation. We had to connect the two together. Uh, I think you see some of that in the, um, in the actual specification. I believe we went through and talked about the specifics there. Uh, so that's probably your best bet for that. Um, and again, the, the, the fact that they don't really have an ontology at this point in time makes SysML very difficult to, to work with that, like adverbs. I, I don't know that even have the concept of it uh, So in what they do. So again, I, I think I think LML is significantly stronger uh, because of that. I've been using LML for quite some time now, but added in a slate kind of by hand because of platform requirements. And do try to stay within the ontology as defined by spec. Sometimes I just free extend, but is there some heuristic such rule of thumb have how to formalize the decision of, okay, I'm going to extend LML here, or is it the usual use of your judgment? So, so well, let me correct you on one thing. It, this is, LML is really not specs per se. Uh, it was defined oh, by... Oh, I think he meant specification. Oh, okay, about the specification. Oh, thank you. Okay, I thought you meant spec innovation. I, I do want to make that very clear. It was a group of people who got together and, decide, and, and put this language together. So we've just implemented it in the tool, have a mechanism to work with it. So uh, basically, we think you should use your judgment. Uh, there's no formal way to extend it unless you want to actually propose um, an extension to the language, which then the group, the working group, could assess and determine if they wanted to add that to the language and make that available to everybody. But uh, yes, no, we think you need to just use your good judgment and figure out what data you need, information you need to capture, and make sure you can do it. And we, we don't think you should be limited. The next question is, is there a recommended way to track a resource constrained trade space within the tool? So far, extending the resource class has had somewhat mixed results in modeling of tightly coupled systems. Hmm, okay. Uh, I'd have to see specifically what you're looking at because we've, we've done some very complex models using resources without extending them, uh, and we track them very well through the simulators. So uh, I'd have to see specifics, I guess, to, to really be able to respond to that. Next question is, is it plausible to add an, a LA tech reader with the tools capabilities range as an implementation strategy for the equation class and essentially a dump a PNG output into the equation entities image metadata. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure that particular one, but I don't see why not. Uh, I would think that I, I'm assuming that's an XML kind of uh, language. Um, latex. I have heard that I've heard of latex. I just don't know much about it personally. Um, you, the answer is probably yes, and the, we have SDK capabilities in the tool where you can go ahead and create those yourself. Uh, I would say we'd be very interested in seeing uh, anything along those lines. Um, I, I'm actually, again, as a physicist, I'm very excited about that idea. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a great question to have afterwards with a developer. 
So our next question is, do you have a map from LML to DM2? I see here the reverse of some of them. Uh, I think we, we, we actually mapped it the other way first, but, but I think I've got something that I could send out for that um, that gets into the details of it. Um, yes. You have a string called properties to add characteristics. Why not use one term, characteristics or properties? Oh, yes. <laughs> so we actually have a class called characteristics, too, so it does get confusing. Uh, and we call them attributes as well. So yes, we're not um, perhaps as consistent as we should be in the, in the implementation. Uh, but again, it's one of those things, I guess I see all these things as being um, Synonyms. <laughs> it's like elements and, and entities. I tend to use those. It's bad practice, you're right. <laughs> so, this is a little bit more of a comment than a question. Um, it would be interesting to break down DM2 projects and relate it, to, relate, relate it as the parent to other LM terms like cost and risk. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be. That'd be very interesting. Um, we have another uh, comment question. So when I modify the schema and the tool, as you've shown, um, is that valid for the project it, um, it's done? And or are the changes valid from the project to project? So, so it's really valid for the project itself. And the way to share it with other projects is, as I mentioned, do that in a clean database and then export that and import it back into another project. And you'll have all that capability with you. Our next question is, the LML website states that the latest LML ontology is coming soon. Is there an ontology that is ready to use from LML rather than from a spec? Uh, so, so yeah, I think we'd always have, I, we'd always hoped we were going to get to that, and I don't think we ever got there. Uh, the OWL thing I did is the closest uh, that we have for that, unfortunately. I was, we were hoping one of the other members uh, who, who know Al better than I do uh, was was supposed to do that, but never got the time to do it. So I'm sorry. The, the only thing I've got is what we've got. Also, with projects, uh, but also with projects, perhaps we need to relate it to the action uh, task to create a uh, WBS. So I, I normally do WBS in the cost entity class because what that allows me to do is not only have the entity, I can then have the uh, cost value associated with that. So if I'm actually using a WBS, I'm often wanting to do that. So, But I can always relate the cost element to uh, an action. And we've actually done that for very large WBSs for major organizations. We have uh, one final comment. Perhaps a cinnamon list or a cinnamon list or a table would be useful. Yes, <laughs> it probably would be. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah, yeah. By the way, there's a feedback form <laughs> on our on our on our uh, in our tool on uh, all the dashboards. Uh, please feel free to use it. Any of these kinds of comments and ideas and thoughts for improvement of tool. We get directly, those go, go directly to the developers. The developers use that information to help uh, develop new, new things for the tool. So we've actually created whole new diagrams uh, by suggestions from users. So uh, I would say I, if almost all our recent uh, changes to the tool have been user driven, and we want to continue that. We want this to be your tool. It's not supposed to be our tool. It's supposed to be your tool. So. Um, we did actually just get another question. Are there any other tools beyond Insight that support LML? Unfortunately, no. We've we've uh, tried to suggest it to other vendors, but they are very happy with what they're doing. <laughs> so, um, so I don't know. I can't, I hope so in the future. Frankly, we didn't. We did not design the language to be a one-tool language. We would like everybody to feel comfortable using it. Uh, I will say if you have any tool where they are using, um, have the ability to extend the schema, 
uh, you can certainly do things, use it, the language. The only thing you'd be missing is probably the action diagram, but the fundamentals of the language would still be available to you. So that nothing prevents you from doing that. Well, that's all the questions that we've received today. If you think of any after the webinar, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd like to thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. As a reminder, we will be following up with you very soon to send you a link to the recording and the presentation slide deck. Our next webinar will be August 8th, and we'll be discussing what is PLM and why it's so important. We also encourage you to visit our website and our blog, as well as connect with us on social media. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you again for your attendance, and we hope to see you again at our next webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day.